Good morning. Good morning. May I have your attention, please? Good morning. I'm Robin Askew, the incoming chair of the Knoxville Chamber of Commerce. I would uh, like to welcome you to the Governor's Breakfast, sponsored by Stowers Machinery. We are thrilled today to have the Governor with us, especially because he is a native Knoxvillian. Uh, he is the CEO of our state, and it's important for us to hear from him once a year as we do. We appreciate him taking time out of his hectic schedule and braving this weather to get here. In addition to the governor, I'd like to take a few minutes to recognize the other elected officials with us this morning. If you would, please uh, hold your applause until I've recognized everyone. Knox County Mayor Tim Burchett, Christy Branscombe, who is the Deputy Mayor. She is here on behalf of Madeline Rahara, who could not be here today. Farragut Mayor Ralph McGill. From our state legislature, we have Senator uh, Becky Duncan Massey, Senator Richard Briggs, Representative Ryan Hayes, Representative Eddie Smith, and Representative Roger Kane. From our county commission, we have John Schoonmaker, Bob Thomas, Brad Anders, and Dave Wright. From city uh, council, we have Mayor Daniel Brown, Marshall Stair, George Wallace, and Finbar Saunders. Thank you all for attending this morning, and thank you for your service to our community. I'd like to recognize the sponsors for our event. The presenting sponsor is Stowers Machinery, and they are joined by uh, sponsors Alcoa and Kramer Rayson. Will the representatives from Alcoa and Kramer Rayson please stand so that we can thank you for your support. We'd also like to recognize Bandit Lights and Mr. Michael Strickland and m, &M Productions for their production assistance with this event. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is the fifth consecutive year that Stowers Machinery Corporation has been the presenting sponsor for this event. Stowers has been tied to the progress, growth, and prosperity of East Tennessee for 55 years. Starting with 70 employees in 1960, they now employ more than 340 people. As East Tennessee's Caterpillar dealership, they rent, sell, and service Caterpillar equipment with locations in Chattanooga, Crossville, Sevierville, and Tri-Cities, in addition to East Tennessee and West, no East and West Knoxville locations. At this time, I'd like to recognize Wes Stowers, President and CEO of the company, to come and say a few words and introduce the governor. Thank you, Robin. It is indeed a pleasure to be here once again to introduce someone who obviously needs no introduction in Knoxville. Our own Bill Haslam was re-elected to his second term as Tennessee's governor with the largest victory in modern Tennessee history. And the reason's clear. Uh, his results-driven, common-sense leadership uh, has made Tennessee a national leader in education, job creation, and fiscal responsibility. His commitment to education has already made a huge difference. Tennessee is the fastest improving state in the country in academic achievement. And he's launched the Tennessee Promise to give graduating high school seniors a chance to earn a certificate or degree beyond high school free of charge. Now, nothing's free. It's paid for. We already have a funding mechanism in place, something the federal government could learn from. Um, Governor Haslam was also focused on making Tennessee the number one location for the, in the southeast for high quality jobs. And Tennessee has been awarded state of the year for economic development. Working with the General Assembly, he's balanced the budget every year, kept taxes low, ensured Tennessee has the lowest debt in the country and nearly doubled the state's rainy day fund. Thanks to the governor's work to make the state more customer focused and efficient, Tennessee's been ranked the third best managed state in the nation. So please join me in welcoming our very own Governor, Bill Haslam. Thanks, Wes. Good morning. Please have a seat. Thanks. All right, I have to confess I was really uh, uh, relieved when I showed up and there were actually people here this morning. 
Yeah, you, so some of you will remember Ned Ray McCorder was the governor of Tennessee, I guess one, two, three, four governors ago, and uh, Ned was from West Tennessee, a little town called Dresden, and pretty big deal, you come out of Dresden, you become governor, and he was home one weekend, and was walking into kind of the equivalent of their local country store, and a guy goes, hey McCorder, and he goes, yeah, and he goes, you're a pretty big deal now, aren't you? And he just said, uh-huh, and he said, well, how many people show up at your funeral will be entirely dependent upon the weather? So when I actually, you all got a lot more snow than middle and west Tennessee did, and so uh, when I pulled into my driveway last night and realized you couldn't find my driveway, and the, the trooper that was driving me drove through my front yard because you couldn't figure out where the driveway was, I thought, you know, it might just be me there in the morning. <coughs> I, uh, it's not about, I, it'd be more embarrassing because it was your hometown, but it, that you have that fear a lot. I was uh, in Fayette County, which is the last county before you get to Shelby County, before you get to Memphis, and was speaking to a group, but it was right, it's a huge agricultural area, you know, 80% of the jobs in the county are agricultural related. And as I, I got there and uh, people were kind of slow trickling in and I realized, well, this is like literally the heart of their season. These guys need to be outside. They don't need to be inside uh, listening to me. And so uh, I, uh, uh, it, but I noticed like as it, 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 it started to cloud up and rain, more people started to come. And so uh, as I got up to speak, I said, hey, thank you very much for coming. And this one guy in the back said, we're only here because it's raining. <laughs> and I, I, so I get it. So about three months, no, about a year later, I was back in Fayette County speaking uh, at a place real near the where I was before. And I told that story, and I said, so I was really nervous today when I pulled up and the, and the sun was out because uh, before the guy had been real clear that uh, he was only here because it was raining. And, and uh, I said, so I really appreciate that even though it's sunny, you're here today. And he said, I hear the same voice in the back say, only here because my tractor's broke. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever reason you're here, I'm really uh, grateful. Well, here's what we're going to, we're going to really quickly move into question and answer. I realize it's a big room, but I, I think there's maybe microphones available, but if not, if, if uh, we're, we're going to move into that real quick. Uh, let me try to give you a, a quick update on, on some things and maybe to take you back to where I was uh, about five weeks ago. I went to the International Auto Show in Detroit, Michigan, uh, and being in Detroit in Jan mid-January, I'm not sure who thought that was a great plan. Um, but you would have been really, really proud uh, to have been a Tennessean, and even particularly to be uh, an East Tennessean from this area, from the valley, uh, as we like to say it. Tennessee's actually become one of the leading automotive manufacturing states with uh, original equipment manufacturers, uh, th uh, really three major original equipment manufacturers in the state, and then all the auto supplier jobs that have spun off uh, from there. But what you might have been even more excited about was so much of the innovation that you're seeing uh, right out of here. So our folks from Alcoa who I think are helping with this uh, breakfast, the, the new aluminum F-150 which is will be a part of the new automotive aluminum process happening right out here in, uh, in Blount County which is a big deal. Or you'd have gone around to see um, the uh, 3D printing of cars and a lot of you are familiar with Local Motors who has a presence here but literally to, to be able to design a car and say well here's what I want my car to look like uh, and to know that a, a company with with, with strong Tennessee connections is right at the center of that. Uh, or uh, if you'd have heard maybe what the biggest buzz about was around all the issues around advanced uh, composite manufacturing, which is th thought of as carbon fiber technology. One of the big quests in automotives is how do we make our cars lighter? And the new CAFE standards, the fuel mileage standards, I think of uh, somebody in the automotive business here can probably tell me exactly, but I think like eight years from now, new cars are going to have to average 56 miles per gallon. Well, there's a lot of challenges in that, but one of those primary challenges is in making vehicles lighter but still safe, and carbon fiber technology is one of the keys to that. So they figured out how to do that on cars that are expensive, so they can sell you a $100,000 car that's made out of carbon fiber. They hadn't figured out how to do that on a car that most Americans can afford, but uh, you might remember back when the president was here six weeks ago or whenever that was, he announced the advanced, uh, the, a big grant, the Advanced Carbon Manufacturing, uh, Composite Manufacturing Institute right out here uh, in uh, Anderson County. What that could mean is, is, is carbon fiber technology moves forward um, 
Knoxville, this, the valley can literally be at the very center of that through efforts at Oak Ridge and other places. Well, that, that's a really big deal when some of the leading technology that we're going to have to have is happening right in our backyard. I say all that just to say there are some really exciting things happening uh, right in our area and it's building on a strength that we have as a state and we're taking our unique uh, capacity whether it be out of Oak Ridge or UT or so many of the other major institutions that are here and capitalizing on that to make it true. I do want to announce one other uh, specific, um, um, well, I was going to announce it and I left the page describing it sitting on my desk at home. Uh, so I'll do my very best to, to describe it, and uh, Mike some, might have to. Uh, the, the acronym is YAY, and it stands for Young Entrepreneurs Alliance. Did I get that right? O Academy, okay. I probably should have somebody else announce this since I left all the details. Uh, <laughs> it's a really big announcement, and anyway, the Academy, they're setting up, I think, a, a handful of academies around the country, and it's basically this idea. It'll, it'll focus on young entrepreneurs and helping them uh, create, develop, and take to market ideas. And Knoxville has been chosen as one of the locations to do that in, and it will be starting October, thanks. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I always need a little help when I'm up here. But uh, even though I left the specific notes, suffice it to say it's a big deal for Knoxville to be chosen. What we want to create here uh, are jobs that are grown here uh, and then are started here and grown here. Com we, we love it when companies of all types come to us uh, from around the country and around the world, but we love it uh, the most when companies start here and grow here because they tend to be tied to our area uh, in a much more direct way. So Knoxville being chosen uh, is one of these locations is a big deal, and we look forward to October and the announce of that. Okay, I'm going to do something a little different. Um, I, I did this, I think, three years ago when I was here. Um, and are the, the, I do see folks with microphones around, I hope. So we're actually going to move into that a little quicker. Starting my second term, as you know, and when I was here, I think maybe the start of my, I think the start of my first year, I said, so what, what's a governor supposed to do? What, what's a new governor need to focus on? Four years later, we have a track record. Um, we're, we, we've, we've begun to, we, or we've really focused on several things, primarily economic development, education, and then running the state in a responsible financial way. So four years into it, if you're a governor and you're, you're beginning your second term with, and knowing that you have the, the, the clock is ticking uh, on what you can accomplish, what should a governor in that situation focus on and do? And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw that out to the crowd for suggestions. I see, this is not a plant, but Mike Edwards raised his hand first. <laughs> you still gotta do the budget. You still gotta do the budget. So we'll, let me talk about that real quick. Um, Anybody, I see a whole table of state legislators here, they can't answer this. Anybody besides that table know what the state's total budget is, counting the federal money? Anybody? All right, about $32 billion, okay, about $32 billion, which sounds like, well, that should be easy to make work. Uh, but when you take really most of our, most of the state's money really goes to, uh, goes to two primary areas, education, K-12, and higher ed. Uh, and Medicaid. Uh, the third after that would be uh, would be corrections and prisons and uh, high, roads are funded by road tax so, so if you count those separate. But at the end of the day the most important thing any government does, I know I see city council folks here, county commission, uh, county mayor and others, uh, the most important thing you do is set the budget and it's the most difficult thing for this reason. In government people think that we are deciding between good things and bad things when that budget comes. But the true reality is we're deciding between good things and other good things, and you just can't fund everything. It's just like at your house. And I remember when I was uh, mayor here and going out, and somebody said, we need more sidewalks in Knoxville. And I thought, we really do. And so we started, I started looking into it and spending more time and realized, well, we do, but to fully put sidewalks in and curbs and gutters and get the right of way and everything costs about a million dollars a mile, and that'll run your budget out pretty quick. And so I use that as an example to say, at the end of the day, the, the most important thing we do is prioritize a budget. And a lot of times, some folks in here are going, well, I don't get why they don't spend more time, more time or more money on this item that I really care about. And the, the, the reality is, is that we have to prioritize. And the story, you, some of you heard me say this before, but everybody wants you to run the state like a business until you do. <laughs> and then they're saying, well, I didn't mean like that. <laughs> 
Th that's the part of government that I like. And um, so, again, whether you're on council or commission or state legislature or my, my role, the, the most important thing you do is budget. And when you go to elect people, you should keep that in mind because at the end of the day, you want them to run the city or the county or the state just like you do your business and your family. What else? What else should, so in, I'll, I'll finish on that. A second term governor has a little bit of an advantage in that you've been doing this for four years and so you understand the issues a little better, but they don't, you understand them better, but they don't get any easier. What else, what else should a governor start in year five do? Okay. Good morning, Governor Haslam. Dr. Anjana Love Dixon. I'm a personal and spiritual advisor to people of influence, Harvard University. Um, my concern about education lies within safe schools. There's the Tennessee Equality Project that allows uh, children of all ethnicities and religious diversity and also sexual diversity um, to feel safe in their schools. I have a middle school son who's had to transfer from one school in the county to a better school in the county. Those schools shall remain nameless. Um, but I would love to know what you have on your agenda to bring about the unity that we sorely need in, in Tennessee because our, our state has such a great potential to grow that I would love to see more sexual diversity um, and acceptance of the LGBTQ community as well as ethnic communities um, and you know, bridging the wealth gap as well. Thank you. Thanks, so uh, I'll say this in terms of leadership from whether it be the state, the city, the county, uh, that I think our words matter in, in whatever the situation we talk about is. So the, the words that we use to address uh, issues matter. The second thing I would say this is, one of the things that I'd love for us to, to do as a state is learn how to bring our, our deepest differences uh, within the public square and have real discussions and conversations about that. We're, we're, going, to have a diff <laughs> we're going to have a different view about really critical and serious issues. But the place is, I, I, I was being interviewed about something in Memphis where I was speaking last night, I said, the place to have those discussions is in the, there, there's the right forums to have that and then there's others. Facebook is not the right place to have those discussions and no offense to Facebook. Uh, but there are critical issues where we need to address our deepest differences, where we're going to have differences. We, we're coming from different places of, of values and perspectives. Uh, but my hope is that we set up, leaders' jobs is to set up the forum for people to actually have those discussions in the right ways. So I, I guess probably that's the best thing I can say there. Ne other questions about uh, the star, or other maybe things in terms of like, as, as, as the governor, what, what should I be focusing on for the next four years? Governor, the, the emphasis today in I, small uh, business okay. on entrepreneurial spirit and all that's being done at the state level to energize those activities. And at the same time today, we face a growing overreach from the federal government that in many ways is, is almost confounding the, the initiatives that, that would spark the engine for entrepreneurship at the state level. Can you talk a little bit about where you see that trending? I, I do, and I, let me say this. I, I actually think I have a pretty good perspective having been a mayor and a governor, and then as, as governor, you interact a lot. I just got back from spending four and a half days in Washington over the weekend, which is a really long time to spend in Washington. Uh, um, he, here's what I honestly believe. The, the closer government is to home, the better it is. I was able to worry about things as mayor that I can't worry about as governor. I was able to worry about things in our budget that how many vehicles the, the city had and what we were doing to control costs. I'm, I'm thinking of an example, just got, happened to see a city car drive by out the door. Um, uh, that I can't do as, government, the, as governor. The point is, uh, the bigger it gets, the harder it gets to manage. And um, the more uh, difficult it is to make the right decisions. End of the day, here's what government's about. You pay us to do what you can't do for yourself. Okay, you can't build your own roads. You can't, uh, you can't run your, you can't build your own prisons. You can't run your own school systems. All, all those things, that's what, people can't do that themselves and so you hire government to do that. Now it's different because you can only hire one government so you hire a monopoly. Um, 
but you hire us to do that and to give you the very best service you can for the very lowest price. And again, whether you're city, county, state, that's how it works. Well, the federal government literally, they, they can't do that. People, I see people that jump on uh, the president all the time because something's not working. And I, I, as everybody knows, I don't, there's a lot of policy issues I don't agree with the president on, but the president of the United States can't run the, the government operation. It's way too big, okay? It's just way too big. And our issue is we've let way too many things end up being federal issues and federal decisions instead of state or local. My bet is this. I bet all of you, you might not like your local property tax. You might not like what you pay in city taxes or county taxes. You might not like the, the 7 percent sales tax you pay that funds state government. But I bet you feel way better about that than you do the money you pay to the federal government. And that's not just ideological. I think it's because you actually can reach out and see and touch the services you get here and you know that somebody's worrying about, uh, you know, Mayor Burchett doesn't spend a dollar without worrying about it. So, you know, you're, 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 really, you're really comfortable that somebody's worrying about that and your commission and council are doing that same thing. I guarantee the legislature will. We have a $32 billion budget, but at the end of the day, these folks will end up having some long discussions about $100,000 items. I'm, I'm not making light of 100000 but in a $32 billion budget, you might think, who's paying attention? They are and we are. And so uh, you asked specifically about the entrepreneurial cl uh, climate, and I think so that the same thing translates into business. The more we need, we need regulation. Uh, I, I'm not somebody that says we should just have anarchy, okay? We need to have, there's appropriate government regulation for business. Uh, the issue is making certain that it is appropriate. And the further you get from an issue, the harder it is to determine appropriateness. And so you might say, uh, here's, a, here's an issue that we can solve 99% of that for, I'm making this number up, for $100,000, or we can solve 100% of it for $500,000. You might say, as a, as a business person, well, that extra 1% is not worth you know, five times the cost. But a, a regulator who's way away from the issue might say, well, yes, it is. Well, we want 100%, not 99%. Local government authorities are able to put that common sense approach into it and solve it, and we're not going to do it. And the more things that end up being decided a long way from home, the harder that is to do. So, um, again, I, I, I just firmly believe, and like I said, having been a mayor, that the closer to home it is, the better decisions you're going to make, and the better money, you, better your your money is going to be spent. Okay. One more thing, you know. Um Good morning, uh, I'm Jula Conanza from American Association for Cancer Support. Uh, as you know, Tennessee, we are ranked number six of uh, unhealthy state. Uh, the physical inactivities, uh, the number is getting skyrocket high here. And i just wondering, are there any way the government can do something to help us become healthier? and uh, so we can stay away from uh, Sure. Uh, yeah, two, two different approaches, two, two different things that we're doing right now or, or attempting to do. The first is an, an effort we call Healthy, Healthy Tennessee. It, it is, uh, part, a lot of our health issues, quite frankly, are, are due to choices that we make. So uh, one in every four Tennessee adults smokes. One in every five Tennessee teenager smokes. Um, our obesity rates are way above the national average. I, I can go on and on about health choices when we're doing that. So we put to, we, we've literally, through some state money and some money we've raised, put together a, a, a governor's foundation on, on health and wellness that is addressing that in very, partic in very specific ways, trying to address some cultural issues that we have as Tennesseans, just to be honest with you. I, I, I love our state, I really do, but we, we, don't, we don't always make the very best personal choices when it comes to our health. And so we have an initiative around that. The second issue, and it's one we're dealing with and we're trying to figure out uh, how to do that, and I, I, I had a proposal to do that in Nashville that hadn't worked so far, but we haven't given up, is what are we gonna do about you know, the, large, the large number of Tennesseans who don't have health insurance coverage? And uh, the reality is if, if you don't, um, then you're probably going to either make bad health choices or access health care in the wrong way. The challenge for us in healthcare is everybody's going to need it, right? So if you get sick and got to go to the hospital, you're going to go to the hospital. The question is, are you getting it in the right way, at the right place, at the right time? And uh, that's why we had a proposal to, to cover approximately 285,000 Tennesseans who don't have it. The challenge for all of us within that is this. 
we can say all that, all that we want, but ultimately what we have to do is we have to come up with a healthcare system that doesn't cost all of us so much money. And uh, that's true on for businesses. I, I guarantee you every business out here worries about what their health insurance costs are and the increasing percentage of budgets. It's true of us as a state. Almost one in every three dollars we spent, that $32 billion I gave you, about one in every three of those dollars is spent on health care, on Medica Medicaid or our employers, employees' health insurance. And it's true of the federal government. Uh, I make the joke all the time that the, the federal government is just about to become a huge health insurance company that happens to have an Army and a Navy and an Air Force attached to it. That, that's, that's how much health care is dominating our federal budget. And we have to do something to address the cost. Specifically, what I think we have to do is to address some market, more market tension into the system. The issue right now with healthcare, again, in my opinion, is, is this. It's like going to the grocery store. You walk in the front door, get your shopping cart, you go up and down the aisles, and you buy things you want, and then every now and then an assistant manager from the store comes in and suggests some things you might get. And you put all those in your shopping cart, you go around, you get to the cash register, and they say, thank you, have a very nice day. And you walk out and get in your car. Well, nobody thinks that's a smart way to allocate any resource, right? Uh, and so, but that's what we do because very few people pay for their own health care costs. Uh, what we're moving toward is something, a system where we have uh, people have, who have more investment in their own outcomes and then we're with providers to do the same thing. Again, when you go to the hospital, um, you're gonna, you, you go have a surgical procedure, you come home, you're gonna get bills from six or seven different entities, right? You get one, you think, oh good, that wasn't so bad. And then you get four or five more, but you're gonna get one from the surgeon, the hospital, the anesthesiologist, the pharmacist, the rehab person, probably leaving out one or two. Uh, and, and yet there's nobody that's overall driving that process. We're moving toward a point, and um, Dr. Briggs, who's now Senator Briggs, has been real helpful uh, in helping folks understand that we're moving to a point where you're going to pay by the episode and by the outcome of that episode in terms of what the results are. Uh, but to do that, we have to w have a way to measure value. So we could pay healthcare providers by the episode now, but we don't have any way to measure quality. So we say, we're going to pay you $50,000 for that uh, hip replacement. Well, that's great, but we, we also want to make certain that there's some incentive for that provider to actually provide a great hip replacement that works. And so figuring out how you measure quality in that and how we end up reimbursing for that is the is the key challenge, but we will get there. Ultimately, to drive better performance, you have to have metrics that you use um, and uh, so that you can, uh, that you can measure value. The trick in all that is the same thing we're seeing in education right now, right? The argument you have in education is everybody agrees, yeah, we, we need better standards, we need better results, better outcomes, we're, we're in a competitive world, okay, great. We need to then measure what the output is. Well, how do you do that? Uh, and so in education, we're having debates today about the, the, the value of measuring what we call TVOS data, the, the improvement scores off of the, the students' TCAPs, um, where some people are saying we shouldn't use that at all, and others of us are saying we have to use some data to measure how well we're doing. It's the same thing in healthcare. And by the way, that's healthcare and education, like I said, those are the two things that government spends all their money on. And it's also the two things that have seen really the highest uh, rate of inflation over the last 20 or 30 years. So my, my view is we have to start measuring outputs and we have to have those healthy discussions about what the metrics should be to determine uh, whether we're having success or not. Yeah, way back here in the back. Thank you, Governor. Uh, my name is Dusty Irwin. And I, I would want to first thank you for the work you've done in education. I have two young sons that are participating in the HOPE and are going to be tradesmen like their father. And I'm grateful for the opportunities they have in our local community colleges. But one of the problems that I'm hearing from the students is that they're in the class, they get good instruction, but there's a limited amount of equipment available for them. For example, my son is uh, uh, being taught or instructed in numerical control programming and machining. There's only one machine operational in the classroom for 20 young men and women to use. And so you were asking, what could we do? I know that's expensive, but we need to broaden or, or try yeah. and get the capital equipment in there so that the humans can 
can use the, utilize them. So and, let, yeah, let, let me jump in on that real quick. You, your son's exactly right, uh, and, I, and, and it's our fault uh, at the state level. Uh, the most imp one of the most important things you do in, in business is allocate capital, okay? That is a business, you sit down and look how you're gonna invest, you decide how are we gonna allocate capital to get the very best return for our shareholders. Unfortunately, we haven't done a good job of that in, in government, and that's a perfect example. And I'll give you another one. I was at one of our Tennessee Colleges of Applied Technology uh, and talking with a guy who taught welding and he said, he said, by the way, Governor, he said, every person who's finished my course for the last two years has been hired immediately. I'm like, wow, you have 100%, I mean, you know, any school, I mean, that, that's your, your dream is to have anything, you know, close to that. And I said, wait, 100%? And I said, well, how many classes do you teach? He said, he said I teach two a semester. And I said, well, why don't we have more classes if everybody's getting hired? And he said, because you haven't given us the equipment to do it. Okay, <laughs> so we started looking at that and started putting some, uh, some efforts in place to, to fund, try to figure out where, where, where's the market telling us we need people, and then what, what do we need to do to produce more folks to do that. In a lot of cases, it literally was the equipment, so we put some extra money in the budget last year and we're doing it this year. Uh, but it, it's a fair case and it's a, I think the, Here's, you all have heard me say this before, but of the jobs that are going to exist 10 years from now, 55% are going to acquire some sort of post-secondary certificate or degree, their four-year degree, two-year degree, or, or technical certificate. What we've got to do is make certain that if that's what the jobs are requiring, that we do two things. We make certain, certain our students know that, that they realize, okay, yeah, I can say that I only need to go to school at high school, but my chances of going, uh, uh, going, getting a job past that go down very dramatically. And then secondly, once we've encouraged those students to be there and to realize what the future looks like, we've got to fund the, the classrooms and the equipment and everything to provide those jobs. And so we're doing that in some very specific ways. Like I said, with we're, including, we're, we're increasing the number of machines to train welders on. We added uh, engineering uh, spots at the University of Tennessee. So all along the spectrum, we're trying to find where the market's saying, we need more folks who are trained to do this and make sure that we that we're, we're, we're providing uh, that, uh, that opportunity for them. It is, it's difficult to do and it takes a while, to be honest with you, to turn the big ship that's the state in terms of how we fund things. But, but we have a real commitment to do that and you can tell your sons that, uh, that the governor said he was exactly right in terms of what the problem is. Let me put in one plug while I'm, while I'm doing this. Everybody knows about our Tennessee Promise, a two years free of community college or technical school. Uh, we, we've gotten good publicity. Everybody doesn't know this. Beginning this year, every adult in Tennessee, every adult in Tennessee can go to one of our Tennessee Colleges of Applied Technology absolutely free, okay? So as you know, people out there in the community, they're trying to struggle and trying to figure out wh where am I in life, but, but one of the trades is particularly interesting to them. Every adult in Tennessee can go to Tennessee College of Applied Technology absolutely free. So pass that message, that's a new law that was passed, again, thanks to our state legislators this past year, uh, and it can really make a difference in filling those jobs. Okay, I've got a couple more, and then I know people actually probably have to go do their real job. Or maybe we don't have a couple more. Oh, there's one, right, right, okay. Does Mayor Burchett have a question? Yeah, he does. All right. Governor, this should be good. Should I stand? Or <laughs> should I, stand? No. I, I just wanted to personally thank you and the legislature for um, putting the money in last year for the forensic center. It serves 22 counties. It's not real sexy. People dying, but it's a. It when when they do die, there is certain things that need to happen to make sure that that justice is served. And and uh, the money in a very tight budget season, uh, the, the people of the 22 counties really do appreciate that. And along those lines, I wanted you to maybe mention, talk a little bit about you and the legislature's role um, when um, legislation or, or bills or laws come down from the federal government that's really just cramming down on you all. And, and on that same vein, I appreciate you letting the counties take care of that, that end of the business because I think they serve the people much better than the state would or even the federal government. Yeah, it's really true. So first of all, uh, I'm pleased. Was pleased to recommend, and, and it, I was grateful that the legislature did do that on the new uh, uh, 
uh, forensic center for here in Tennessee, for here in Knox County. And to Tim's point, they, you do help take care of 22 counties around, so that was an easy sell for us when it went in the budget. When you introduce new things in the budget, by the way, that's what's hard. It's, if it's stuff that's already been in the budget, people are like, oh, okay, that's, you know, that's okay. New stuff feels like fresh meat to people. They're like, whoa, 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 if you're gonna do that, then you can do this. And so it really helped that in this case, truly, Knox County was serving as a hub for 22 other counties, and you and Brad and some others came over and made a great case for that. You talked about kind of, the, again, the relationship between the federal government and state and state and local. Uh, it really, I mean, I think one of the big tricks in our country right today is to get everybody's roles and responsibilities right. Like, who should do what? And uh, back to what I said before, again, the closer to home the government is, the better it's going to do. So I actually think that the best discussion we could have in this country right now would be, we, we all agree there's, by the way, I think some people think, well, Republicans don't believe in government. We think government's bad. Well, we think government's good. I'll, I'll, I think government's good. I wouldn't be given my life to do this. But we think government's best when it's, uh, well managed and under control and there's certain things that the federal government does that quite frankly aren't under control and, and probably true I know it's true of us as the state uh, it, but it's less true the closer you get to home so that discussion about what roles who should do what and where the state of Tennessee cannot have an army we get that okay we, we have a National Guard we can help but we can't protect the country in that way so there's it's not there, there's certain roles that the federal government has to do because they're interstate areas but there's a lot more things that the state could do and run better, and it's, I know it's true of local government as well. So one last question, then I'm gonna let everybody go. Good morning, my name is Elizabeth Rowland with Tennessee China Network, a new organization to educate and connect people across Tennessee that do business with China. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you plan to do in your second term with regard to improving Tennessee's competitiveness internationally specifically with uh, attracting foreign investment and promoting Tennessee exports. Yeah, Thank great. You. Uh, particularly with regard to big uh, emerging markets and growth markets like China. Yeah, Thanks. great question. So let me actually, I'm gonna start really big, I'm gonna start at 30,000 feet in terms of what we can do and, and come back home. One of the best things that can happen uh, is there's a, um, there's currently a trade agreement being discussed in Washington that's really important. It's called the Trans-Pacific Trans Trade Agreement. This is actually one of those, believe it or not, where uh, primarily um, the president is on the same page with most of the Republican Congress. Not all, but most of that. Um, but there's issues. There's some folks um, on the far left of the spectrum that don't li like to happen because they're afraid of the impact it primarily being uh, driven by some unions and some folks on the far right that are afraid of some of the international consequences. But here's the reality. For states, or for countries that, uh, that where, where we actually have a trade agreement with, that the United States has a trade agreement, our business, our exports out of Tennessee with those countries uh, average about three or four times as much as they do with countries that don't, we don't have a trade agreement with. So China would be impacted by this as, as well as a lot of other countries in Asia. You might think, well, that, that, this is a good example. That's a federal, we can't, we can't do trade agreements but we're dramatically impacted by it. In the automotive industry, where, we're, again, we have such strength is, is determined by that. So starting at 30,000 foot, you can help by, and actually I think most of our legislative delegation, congressional delegations with this, help by uh, when they talk about um, the Trans-Pacific Trans Trade Agreement saying that's something we're for because it will help increase our exports. In terms of then coming back to the state level, we've actually worked really hard on those, on those, on those issues. And so what we've done is two things. We've, we've actually, on the export end, we, we've had, the state of Tennessee has had offices, international offices around the country. They have primarily been working on foreign direct investment, getting foreign countries to invest here. And by the way, we've done really well. Uh, I'll give you an example. With Japan, which is our largest um, trade uh, partner as a state, Tennessee, we're, we're like the... 15th or 16th largest state, but we have the second largest Japan, uh, Japanese investment of any country, trailing only Japan, which, I mean, trailing only California, which has some size advantages on us. But so we've done pretty well, quite frankly, as a state in encouraging foreign direct investment. We can do better. What we haven't done a good job of is exports. And so we've turned around those, our offices in the countries around the world to have them focus more on exports, helping Tennessee companies sell their products there. And we are making some steps. One of the things that helps us there is we, we're becoming known as a leading, auto, uh, leading advanced manufacturing state. And I talked about some of the innovative ideas that are coming out here as well as some of the traditional um, manufacturing that we're known for. 
So the more that can happen, the better. I, I'll end with this, and, and it's, um, it, it's why the challenge around education is so important to us. Here's the reality. In, in, like I said, we talk a lot about being a leading automotive manufacturing state, and we are. We have, you know, from Nissan, uh, Nissan's plant in Smyrna, Tennessee, builds more cars uh, in, in vehicles than any other auto plant in, North Amer in, in, in the United States of America, okay? I can go on and on with statistics, so we've done that. They've trusted us to build stuff. What they haven't just trusted us to do is to do the brain work behind it. So uh, we have companies that build, build, all, build a lot of automobiles or build a lot of things here, but their R&D function happens somewhere else because they're just not convinced that we have the depth of engineering talent and other things that they need to do it. The reason we're focusing so hard on education is we ultimately got to produce those workers where people say, yeah, we trust you not just to build this, but to design it as well. And I use that as an example of the, the depth of knowledge that's needed. So to do that, we've got to have a lot more Tennesseans go to school beyond high school. To do that, they have to be prepared when they get there. Right now, 70% of the students that finish high, K through 12 in Tennessee, when they get to community college, they need remedial work. Okay, 70% need remedial work when they get there. If you need remedial work when you get to community college, and there's some folks from Pellissippi here doing a great job, but if you need remedial work when you get there, there's a 17% chance you'll actually complete and get a two-year degree, 17. And it makes sense, right, because you look around and say, well, you're going to school, you're taking remedial classes, so the hours aren't counting, your buddy's out making money, he didn't, he didn't, go, to, he didn't go to community college, he's out making money, you're thinking, this is crazy, I'm quitting. So what we have to do is make certain that not only do people go to school beyond high school, but that they're prepared, and it's why we're working so hard uh, to, to improve education in Tennessee. We can do all that here. I, I'm convinced, uh, I'm, I'll end right here, I'm convinced beyond a doubt we can compete with anybody, whether it be uh, in encouraging exports or bringing foreign direct investment in here, but we have to compete with everybody because that's the world that we live in. So I, I want to just end by this. Uh, the, the, I, I, have, I have a different viewpoint now than I had as mayor. I, I, get, the, I get a chance to see what chambers do all around the, uh, the state, and I, I, they didn't ask me to do this, but I want to put a plug for how impactful the chamber is here in terms of particularly issues around education. They were the ones sounding the, the, the alarm long before other folks, as well as business recruitment. We have some good successes, uh, hopefully, coming down the road here in, in the very near future. But that's what this community can do. You can help, t say, as a state, we've got to raise our expectations and raise our standards because that's the world we live in. So. Thank you all very much. I, I'm, like I said, I'm flattered that you'd come out on a snowy day, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be back home. Thanks so much. Thank you, Governor Haslam, for taking the gutsy move to open yourself up to questions from a bunch of cabin fever Knoxvillians. Uh, all you've done is watch CNN or Fox or whatever you watch, and I'm sure I was a little nervous there when you did that. Uh, as you know, the Chamber uh, stands with you on all of your efforts on to reform education and prepare Tennesseans for the workforce, and we appreciate everything you've done. You make us proud, and I want you to know that the Chamber also is looking forward to working with you to make Tennessee the best place for businesses to relocate and expand. Thank you again for being here. We're adjourned, thank you.